When we left off part two, I said that V for Vendetta is a book about love. I did not mean that it's a love story. Evie and V do not get together in the end. This is not a comedy, and it isn't clear at all whether or not there will be a happy ending. If it were a comedy, it would be a comedy in the sense of Dante's divine comedy, which is the story of one man's descent into hell, uh, his climb through purgatory, and his arrival in paradise. V is not Dante in that comedy, though. V would be the guide. This book, V for Vendetta, would match up best with the first part of the Divine Comedy, the Inferno, which takes place in hell. Dante's guide through hell was the great Roman poet Virgil. Virgil. V. Huh. Where was I? Oh, Virgil walked Dante through hell, showing him all the ins and outs of the Inferno. As time passed, Dante became more and more comfortable interacting with the shades of the damned, and at the end of the poem, Dante has, in a sense, conquered hell. Dante climbs up Satan's body to leave hell, passing this way into purgatory. Virgil was not able to follow. Though Virgil had learned the truth about the universe, he was not a Christian and he was unable to leave hell. He could only help others do so. V is Evie's guide. V is teaching her what she needs to do to communicate with the shades of the damned in Norsefire's England and what she needs to do to escape how V teaches Evie what she needs to know is the subject of today's talk. I think it's a fair metaphor to say that V walks Evie through hell in chapters 5 to 13. I'd also like you to think of these chapters as a, as a version of martyrhood that's being offered to Evie. She can betray V, acting as a faithless disciple, a Judas, or she can keep V's secret and be killed. She doesn't want to betray V. What gives her the strength to keep her decision? Her decision not to betray V. Well, it's a note. A note that she finds written in pencil on a piece of toilet paper that gets shoved through a hole in the wall on page 154. The note is from someone named Valerie, and it tells her story. Valerie's story is about love. Valerie had written a kind of testament a kind of autobiography on a piece of toilet paper. It wasn't a self-serving story, though, about how great Valerie was. Instead, it's a testament of love. Valerie wrote her story as a story of self-discovery. From a young age, Valerie had known she was gay. She struggled in school and in life, trying to find a place for herself where she could love and be loved without fear and without repercussions. She was born in 1957 and lived through a time hardly friendly to lesbians. In the mid-1970s, she became an actress and decided to move to London. Now, note for a second what's going on while we learn Valerie's story on pages 156 to 60. Evie is being tortured. She's being nearly drowned repeatedly. The guards are torturing her to make her betray V. Now, Valerie found her world in London. She soon found fame. In a film called The Salt Flats, she won awards, but more importantly, she found love. In 1992, after the war, her lover was captured and tortured. She gave up Valerie to the police to save herself, but Valerie forgave her. Valerie was tortured in prison, much like Evie had been. Head shaved, partially drowned, humiliated. So what kept Valerie sane? Only one thing. She knew that she had been happy, and that she had been right to be happy. She had hurt no one. She said that she had given up everything except one last inch. I want you to think about her words. What was that one inch she refused to give up? Now, Valerie doesn't rant about how unfair everything was, or how angry she was about how she was treated. She merely reached out to a fellow inmate to comfort them telling that inmate, quote, I don't know who you are or whether you're a man or a woman. I may never see you. I will never hug you or cry or get drunk with you. I hope that you escape this place. I hope that the world turns and that things get better and that one day people have roses again. I wish I could kiss you. On page 160, we see Evie kiss the, the piece of toilet paper. She's decided that she, too, will keep her last inch. 
If someone else could be at peace through all this horror and still love, well, then Evie knows it's possible. She decides she will do the same. She will, out of love, defend that last inch. I want to emphasize that what we're seeing here is a form of Christian martyrdom. Martin Luther, in The Freedom of a Christian, had written that a Christian could be jailed or tortured or killed only in the body, not in the spirit. While the body was a slave to all, the spirit of a Christian was entirely free. That was because, according to Luther, the Christian did not have to worry about the death of the body. The Christian only had to worry about the death of the spirit. Evie has come to realize that her body was trapped, but her spirit was hers to control. She could decide whether or not her spirit would die. On page 161, she realizes that there are worse things than bodily death, and she decides to keep that last inch. On page 162, we find our next theme. Along with love, we find that this book has been about freedom, a freedom that can only be found through love. When Evie refuses to cooperate with her captors, even though it will save her life, she has become free. The guard tells her, then there's nothing left to threaten with, is there? You're free. Evie has made a huge leap into freedom. She moved from being willing to die rather than betray V to being willing to, to die rather than betray herself. She has become a saint. Of course, Evie doesn't die. It's been a charade, all put on by V in the basement of the shadow gallery. Evie wasn't in any danger except the danger that she might betray herself. On page 167, Evie confronts V. V admits everything and says that it was done, quote, because I love you, because I want to set you free, unquote. You have to admit, this is not the usual kind of love we deal with in romance movies or greeting cards. This isn't parental love. This is some species of philosophical love, what we might call platonic love. As a matter of fact, what we read on pages 168 to 172 comes right out of Plato's Republic. There, famously, Plato had posited the idea of a cave in which men lived, where they were chained in such a way that they could only see the shadows of real things and not the things themselves. In their ignorance, they thought the shadows were the real things. They were slaves in their minds, unable to see the truth or understand it if they saw it. When one was set free and left the cave, he returned and tried to convince the rest that they were living in bondage and ignorance, but they rejected him, asking only to be left alone with their shadows. V has freed Evie from this cave and forced her to see the light. As V says on 170, I didn't put you in a prison, Evie. I just showed you the bars. V asks Evie to confront the feeling of having the lies stripped away from her, to face the truth, to see the world as it is. V takes her to the roof of the building. In an important moment, Evie refuses to be blindfolded, and V says that there will be no more blindfolds. Evie now has eyes with which to see. It's a bit later, on pages 174 and 75, that we finally learn what happened at Lark Hill, what made V into V. It was Valerie. Sitting in room five, V must have gone mad, tormented, tortured, experimented on. The woman in room four, though, passed a note to V through the wall. We could see V turning in to the heartless, revenge-driven killer sought out by Eric Finch, the leader of the police. A person who killed as many of his persecutors as he could. V as a person driven mad by hatred. What Valerie did, though, was change that person, make that person into an avenger for all wronged people. A person who wanted to preserve the world that had made Valerie, someone who could be so wronged and yet not stop loving. V is a demon who has been redeemed by love. This is why V identifies so strongly with the villains, the devil, the antagonists. V is a villain, driven by a desire for vengeance, by a vendetta. However, the evil power V holds is used for good because of Valerie's redemptive love, the love of a slaughtered lamb. Oh, one last thing for this part three. On page 183, Evie takes her teddy bear 
and doll and children's book out of her room in the shadow gallery and, uh, and tells V she wants to get rid of them. V takes them from her, but does not throw them away. V stores them in a, in a valise. Evie has grown up. She has set aside her childish things. We know she's grown up because V now calls her Eve for the very first time instead of Evie. As the book continues, this new Eve will redeem mankind.